Hello friends, this is Sabrina Lewick from the Institute for Enology and Viticulture, back with another presentation, this one on tannin and color extraction and management. So I have a pretty embarrassing confession to make. Um, so those previous videos I did for you, I was trying to slow my voice down and I wasn't using my natural speaking voice. I was really worried that people wouldn't understand what I was saying if I was going at my full clip. But uh, I think it's time to drop the, the pretenses. <laughs> so I'm going to be going pretty fast through this one, speaking in my regular cadence with an occasional flare up of Canadian accent. But before, Here's a cute photo of Digby for basically no reason. Um, he is drinking a really lovely high anthocyanin, high tannin wine, Cheval de Andes from Mendoza, Argentina. And I just included it because he's cute as hell. Let's start our presentation today by looking at some examiner's reports because those things are solid gold. Um, I just completed my stage one assessment and uh, still don't know how I did, but um, I know that reading through those examiner's reports was really helpful for me um, on one of the recent questions because I actually had an idea of what they were looking for. So let's dive in and do some digging here. What are the roles of tannins in wine and how can a winemaker vary their extraction and presence in wine? An interesting question which allowed the candidate to use some crossover to the practical paper in terms of the importance of tannin to wine style, longevity, balance, etc. These concepts needed to be combined with a solid technical knowledge of the types and sources of tannin and how these can be manipulated via extraction, addition, and other winemaking processing procedures. Very few candidates attempted to define different types of tannins of the grape and where they occur and how they should be managed. Skin, pulp, seeds, stem. Most made no mention of other non-grape tannins that can be added to the mustard wine. Many candidates seem to only mention red wine making. However, tannin and phenolic extraction is also key to sparkling wines and some whites. Many scripts were basic and only dealt with the classical extraction techniques in reds with common examples of pre-fermentation maceration of Pinot styles, carbonic maceration, flash and thermo with little mention of the end results and type of tannin extracted. Similarly, very few candidates talked about temperature ranges in tannin extraction rate. Complete answers should have shown a basic understanding of some phenolic chemistry and the basic phenolic units which go to make up a tannin in wine, and there were very few that addressed this. Additionally, mention should have been made as to how the role of oxygen changes the structure of tannins in wine, the size of tannin, and organoleptic effect. So I've highlighted some things in red for us to go back to in a little bit. How can a wine's tannin profile be managed during vinification? Oh, this is a long examiner's report, and I think I'm going to get tired if I have to read all of it out loud. So uh, I've highlighted some red sections here. Candidates must demonstrate an understanding of the tannin extraction process, the use of aids to extract and or fix tannins, and the use of oak tannins. Candidates should also discuss microoxygenation. Great, we're going to go over that. With these types of questions, a logical flow to the answer helps immensely. As winemaking itself is a flow from one activity to another, it makes sense that answers cover the winemaking process in a coherent way. Okay, so when we discuss uh, the different techniques, we'll go over it in a chronological order, kind of like how we might structure an essay. Other red thing I highlighted, Points raised should have been in connection with stabilizing the color with tannin or improving structural elements of early pressed wines. Okay, we can go over that. Uh, judicial tannin management is very important at entry level. Okay, so the, uh, to me that reads um, early press times, thermovinification, etc. Uh, they also want us to talk about finding press fractions in free run uh, for management of tannin clear understanding of various cap management techniques, post-fermentation maceration and other post-fermentation operations that, um, that can manage tannin like microox, aging in barrels. So we'll go over that. 
I also threw in this question, um, this one specifically for color management. So what are the winemaker's options and challenges in color management for different wine styles? So this examiner's report talks about the interrelating notions of tannin management and also pH and wine stability are critical. Most candidates seemed comfortable covering color extraction techniques in different winemaking styles, but a number of candidates simply described the practices of in obtaining color answering the first part of the question only. Others use statements like high temperatures and longer time, so more specific factual insight is required. Uh, candidates often failed to mention or showed poor understanding of winemaking processes post-fermentation, additions like tannin, color, enzymes, and oak, and fining, as well as the role of oxygen. The best answers covered at least a few of these areas, giving a more complete answer. So one of the reasons that I like this examiner's report is there's so much crossover in between color extraction and tannin extraction. So when we talk about them, it's really easy just to talk basically about the same processes. So what do we need to cover? On the theory side, uh, different types of tannins and color compounds, where they come from, and what does oxygen do? On the management side, we'll talk about cap management techniques, ferment temperatures, extraction and stabilization aids, including exogenous tannins, so those are product uh, tannins that we add to ferments, enzymes, oak, and oxygen. We'll talk a little bit about press cut and maceration time in terms of early press or extended maceration. Moving on to the theory portion of this presentation, we'll talk about tannin and color compounds and the role of oxygen. But firstly, the scope of this presentation, because it's easy to get completely overwhelmed. So, when I was going to school, this was the kind of chart that they showed us for phenolic compounds. And this is simply too much info. Let's narrow a little bit. So I've highlighted a couple different classifications of compounds and these are ones that are more important to wine quality and things that uh, were mentioned in these examiner's reports. So anthocyanins at the top here are color. The flavin threols are um, structural tannins and I've highlighted catechins here because those are seed tannins. And on the phenolic acid sides here I've highlighted hydrolyzable tannins. Those are tannins that are derived from oak. So to simplify, those catechins, the small bitter or astringent tannins that come from skins and stems. There are larger structural tannins that come from skins, color that comes from skins, and also uh, the contribution of oak tannins. A disclaimer, uh, it's pretty obvious that I am not a phenolic chemist. Um, the more I dive into phenolic chemistry, the more confused I get, which is friggin miraculous in its own way. So uh, sometimes it can be hard not to get pulled under in all the details. I'm doing my best to give you some detail and knowledge and vocabulary that can be used in, these, uh, in your essays but I don't want us to get bogged down in too much detail. So, this is catechin. This is found in higher concentrations in seeds and stems. As seeds develop, they, get a, um, they go from green to brown in color as the tannins sort of lignify and get longer and less extractable. And as the seeds develop, they also develop a waxy coating on the outside. Um, the purpose of the waxy coating is for the seed to survive going through a bird, honestly, so that it can be pooped out elsewhere and form another vine. Uh, the waxy coating is pretty important um, for us in winemaking because those seeds with a better waxy coating that are more mature extract less of those bitter tannins into our wine. It's something that you kind of know already inherently. Wines that have a more green or underripe character have more bitterness that comes from seed extraction. So riper fruit has less extractable catechin, and I wish that I had access to this, present, uh, this other presentation, but a couple years ago, Dr. Steve Price from ETS 
uh, did a seminar and uh, they were actually monitoring catechin levels. I think it was 2015 in Napa Valley and they were monitoring them as fruit developed um, in the vineyard. And what they were seeing was in, in many sites, catechin values um, that were extracted were basically going to zero. Um, so again, something that we sort of know anecdotally is that these really ripe wines, especially that sort of ripe Napa style, they're very plush, they're not bitter. So uh, they were actually seeing those values go to zero. Additionally, um, the wheel turns and uh, old is new again. So wines with stem inclusion, um, which are quite trendy in certain styles of Pinot or Rhone style wines, um, since they have a contribution from stem tannin, which includes a lot of catechin, we're going to see higher levels of catechin in those wines that are fermented on stems or include whole cluster. So this image uh, here can get a little confusing. It does look like a little bit of chicken wire. So just kind of imagine it more like a little green blob. <laughs> Moving on to tannin. So this is our structural tannin. So the thing that's providing weight and mouth filling tannin in our mouth. It is a polymer of catechin, so it means it's a bunch of different catechins stuck together in forming a long kind of chain. So tannin exists in skin, stems, and seeds, but the most important one for our winemaking exists in the skins. So on the right here, I have an image of what uh, tannin can look like. So you can see that we have a bunch of different units stuck together. And really, it's easier to imagine like a bunch of catechins just in a chain here. Sometimes it can have side branches as well. The sensory impact of these kind of tannins. So larger tannins are more astringent and kind of coarse and drying than smaller tannins, which tend to have more bitterness. Seed tannins, uh, ten, or, excuse me, tannins that are extracted from seeds tend to be more astringent than the same uh, size of skin tannin uh, extracted from the skins. Um, so again, uh, if you talk to a winemaker, sometimes they're trying to minimize seed extraction or they say that things can be seedy. So it's uh, kind of known on the palate that seeds just have a little bit more of an astringent or bitter impact compared to a more lush that, that might come from the skins. Here is an anthocyanin. And these are the pigments that generate the red and purple color of our grapes and our wine. They contribute very little to the taste of the wine. Um, they are more there for color. Um, I could do an entire other presentation on the sense of the relationship between polymeric, which is uh, anthocyanins that are attached to tannins, uh, so polymeric anthocyanins and sensory impact. It's uh, an, a bit of a deep dive where things get confusing. We're not gonna go into that today. So imagine this chicken wire as uh, this little red blob. So uh, I'll only do one slide on those polymeric pigments. Um, a polymeric pigment is when that color blob is attached to another color blob or that color blob is attached to a tannin. Uh, so in general, when we have more of those polymeric pigments, the wine has a greater perception of viscosity or smoothness. So um, if you uh, maybe are not in a public place, put your hand out in front of your face. Like look at all the tips of your fingers. Uh, imagine that you put like, we know when you're a kid and you put like little raspberries on your fingers, like little hats, or maybe I was the only person that did that. But you remember how you could put all those little raspberries on the end and then you have little caps on your fingers? Basically, that's the relationship between tannin and color. Tannins can be pokey. So once we have color put onto the end of the pokey tannin, it's less pokey. So it has more of a, a, a sensory perception of smoothness in our palates. Um, I actually think that that stupid analogy is pretty good because yeah, you're putting color on the end of the pokey thing and it's less pokey now. <laughs> Basically that's happening in wines as they age. The individual little color compounds are hooking up with the tannins. And this brings us to elagitannins, which is a fancy way of saying oak tannins. 
So these are tannins that are extracted from oak products, um, and those could be uh, conventionally coopered barrels, um, toasted oak powder, liquid oak, everything in between. So the specific chemical reactions are being studied, um, including how they interact with grape tannins. Um, as I said previously, I am not a phenolic chemist. But um, one of the more obvious reactions is when these guys hook up with anthocyanins and stabilize the color. So um, other oak-derived compounds uh, have been known to have interactions with um, color or tannin. So acetaldehyde that's extracted out of the barrel, furfural, which is a ca uh, caramel aroma, and vanillin, which is the vanilla aroma, can interact with color and help stabilize it. Um, these tannins uh, in wine exist around sensory thresholds, so they're just barely detectable. So um, scientists think that they have a small astringency contribution overall, um, but uh, collectively as a group. Um, but we can't really piece it out that easily in terms of what does gallic acid taste like? What does elagic acid taste like? So imagine it more like just a block like this. Don't imagine those uh, big chicken wires or small chicken wires as they are. Oxygen is super important. Acetaldehyde is an oxidized alcohol. Um, and this oxidized alcohol glues different phenolics together, especially those small catechin type ones to make them build into a larger chain that has, is less bitter and more um, astringent. So this is sort of the inevitability. This is what it looks like if we're looking at chicken wire here, acetaldehyde hooking up with these small tannin compounds. So here's sort of the expectations of what we'd have with a tannin chain, but here's really the reality of it. Um, it tends to be a giant mass. Uh, we classify these things as colloids, so they're not actually even entirely in solution. And if the colloid gets too big, eventually it falls out of the wine, and that's where we get the wine sediment in our wine bottles. So, the tannin concentration of wines actually increases with age, and that's not because you're gaining any more materials necessarily, it's just because everything's binding up into a giant mass. All the little bits start gluing together to form that giant tannin polymer, so tannin is inevitable, just like Thanos. Things to remember before we dive into the practical management side, um, those monomeric anthocyanins are unstable. So those are the individual little color molecules. So to stabilize them, what um, has to happen is those monomers have to bind up to something. That way that they, they can't get bleached by sulfur dioxide. Additionally, tannin structure can be modified um, with oxygen and time. So practical management time. So there's a common theme here. The raw material is the most important factor influencing the final tannin and color concentration of a wine. So that's why wine farming is so important in high-end wines. Um, we do have control in the cellar. Um, however, really, if the material is lacking in the first place, it's really hard to modify it and plump it up. Additionally, um, I did a lot of literature review to come up with this presentation, and the more I looked at stuff, the more uh, my eyes started to cross. There's a lot of conflicting studies out there, so I'm gonna mention a few things, but I'm gonna try and not confuse both you and myself by uh, going over a lot of conflicting studies. So we're gonna go through uh, the winemaking process basically step by step chronologically. Um, one of the reasons that I wanna go through this information chronologically is that if you're structuring an essay, it makes quite a bit of sense to go through things chronologically for a uh, paper two style. So um, starting with fruit crushing, 
Um, there's a pretty simple relationship here. When you crush your fruit through crusher rollers, what happens is you release juice from those berries and therefore you get more skin to juice contact in your maceration. And therefore, because you have more skin to juice contact, you're gonna get a greater extraction of color and tannin. So I've included a little uh, graph here um, on Merlot and um, so it's a little confusing looking. They have skin proanthocyanidins and seed proanthocyanidins. Basically, this just means skin and seed tannin concentration. Read it that way. This is on Merlot. So you can see that the skin and seed extraction went up as they, uh, the percentage of crushed berries went up. So simple relationship there. More crushing equals more tannin extraction. At this stage, the winemaker could also choose to add a maceration enzyme. So these commercial enzymes are mixes of different enzymes that attack the grape cell wall. Um, and uh, in doing that, they help extract the stuff from inside the grape cell. And that includes anthocyanins and tannins that are in there. So this is going to increase the amount that's extracted overall. But it's going to also increase the rate of extraction because when you have an enzyme, it lowers the activation energy of a reaction, so it just makes things happen faster. Um, increasing the rate of extraction can be important for uh, several different styles of winery, especially wineries that are larger and more efficient. So um, your tanks during harvest are a, um, a really valuable real estate. And if you can shave a couple days off of your maceration time, which means you can put a new thing in that tank, that's just good seller economics. So um, if you can extract more earlier, uh, it's really helpful. Um, these ed enzymes that a winemaker can add usually are uh, proprietary mixes of pectolytic uh, enzymes, which break down pectin in the cell walls. Um, cellulase, which breaks down cellulose in the cell walls, and hemicellulase, which breaks down hemicellulose in the cell wall. Uh, so these are all just mixes of these different enzymes. Here's an example of an enzyme. We use this here at College Cellars really frequently. And uh, this is Scottzyme Color Pro. Um, so it's a pectinase with protease side activity. So it's breaking down pectins, and it's also breaking down a few proteins. Um, so uh, it's going to increase our level of extraction in wine. And I won't read out that full description. Um, if you want more information, you can also find this on the Scott Labs website. At this stage, a winemaker could also add some tannin, so an exogenous tannin, meaning a tannin that doesn't come from the grape berry originally. So there's multiple sources of tannins, um, and just like those um, uh, enzyme adjuncts, they're going to be a couple mix of a couple different things. So some sources include oak, um, toasted and untoasted, chestnut wood, um, exotic woods, including tara and quebracho. Quebracho? How the fuck do you pronounce that? Quebracho? You know when you see a word and you realize that you've never said it aloud or heard anyone say it aloud? Just like that. Um, moving on, uh, gallnut um, is also a popular source of tannin, um, and uh, simply enough, these tannins can come from grapes, including the skins and seeds of other grapes where they're uh, extracted and purified. So here's an example, again from Scott Labs, of an exogenous tannin that a winemaker could add called FT Rouge. So, um, specifically formulated for the North American market. I love that. Um, so, highly reactive tannins, which means that they're going to go in and they're going to link up with our already existing tannins in the wine that come from the grapes. So, this is derived from exotic woods and chestnut. Um, and uh, I've highlighted here that this preserves the grapes natural tannins so they can combine with anthocyanins to create optimal stable color. So, um, uh, this brings up another concept. Uh, there is a term called sacrificial tannin. And what ends up happening in wines as wines are crushed and anthocyanins are extracted, um, 
those little phenolics react with naturally present proteins um, and therefore they bind up and drop out. So a sacrificial tannin ad will bind up with those proteins so that the natural grape tannins can actually be retained in the wine. Um, this is a theory um, and uh, I don't know if anyone actually has been able to track the fate of these added tannins and if they really are binding up with the proteins and helping to preserve the natural tannin and color that comes from the grapes. But either way, uh, that's referenced here in um, this little block from Scop Labs. Another example here from Lafore USA, this is Tannin VR Supra, and it's a vinification tannin for red wines. So combining the effects of proanthocyanidinic and elagic tannins, basically what that means is stuff that comes from grapes and stuff that comes from oak. Proanthocyan, oh Jesus, I'm having a rough day. Proanthocyanidic, nailed it, and elagic tannin. So uh, that first one is derived from grape, that second one is derived from oak. And uh, a note on pre-fermentation maceration, also known as cold soak. So we've crushed our fruit. Um, it's uh, instead of immediately inoculating it, we're moving it to a cold section of our winery or putting it in a tank with chilling capacity. And we're holding it under 10 degrees Celsius for a period of time. And this is supposedly to extract um, color and tannin up front. Um, the reason I mentioned the 10 degrees Celsius thing, that's also maybe an example to use in um, temperature management. Um, once you get above 10, um, it's easier for um, negative yeast and bacteria to grow. So to keep things stable and, um, and clean, we want it below 10C. So the Scott Labs website, although there is a debate about the effectiveness of cold soaking prior to fermentation, many winemakers are firmly committed to the practice. They feel that the early extraction of color and tannin, or with the early extraction of color and tannin, they end up with better structure and faster stabilization of color. So, like many things in winemaking, this one just straight up comes down to winemaker opinion. Um, a little bit of science behind this. Um, so, when we're cold soaking, we have no ethanol present. So, the things that are going to start to get extracted are going to be water soluble things, in mainly anthocyanin because tannin comes out a little bit later, it's more ethanol soluble. Um, also thinking about um, thermodynamics, things happen really slowly at cold temperatures. So um, that's a reason why ferment temperature can be really important for tannin extraction. So basically we have no alcohol and we have very limited heat. So um, this one person, my opinion, uh, is that it uh, has a pretty low level of effectiveness. Uh, the only thing I'll mention here is that if you have aldehyde formation during this stage, which is an oxidative thing, basically um, it smells like those bruised apple sherry aromas um, that are forming due to um, small mem uh, amounts of microbial development, this can actually stabilize uh, tannin in color. Um, but I don't know, I feel like that might be negligible one woman's opinion. So here is a study uh, and actually from a fellow MW student, uh, Federico Casasa. So uh, he looked at the impact of cold soak and SO2 on Malbec and Barbera. Um, so each of uh, these two different varieties had either 50 or 100 milligrams a liter of SO2 added. To give you a little bit of context with those numbers, um, 50 is uh, milligrams a liter of SO2 is um, a, a moderate to high value for clean, clean fruit. 100 milligrams a liter of SO2 on fruit is like your, uh, a, a number I'd see more on uh, fruit with spoilage on it, or excuse me, fruit with rot on it from the vineyard. Um, so they, uh, in the cold soak with 100 milligrams a liter of SO2, they saw increased color saturation, um, increased color intensity, um, and in Stringency and Barbera, no sensory impact on Malbec. So uh, there was an impact of that higher level of SO2. Um, 
another rabbit hole to go down is um, high levels of SO2 like this actually can impact the way that the yeast behaves and it actually impacts a pathway that moves sugar to ethanol and what happens is it actually shunts uh, that pathway into acid aldehyde production and more aldehyde means more stable color and more stable tannins. So I don't know if that's in play here, um, but higher levels of SO2 up front tend to mean higher levels of, um, or more stable color. So while we're discussing macerations, um, we'll go uh, skip a little bit ahead and go to the post-fermentation maceration, or X-Max, as we call them here on the, on the production side, extended macerations. So this is going to increase your tannin, but not your anthocyanins. So your total phenolics are going to in keep increasing, um, but anthocyanins reach a maximum pretty early in the process, like three to five days. So um, here's a couple of studies here, or actually just one study um, from the USA on Cab Sauv and Merlot from Washington. This was uh, done at Washington State University. And this was 10 versus 30 day skin contact times. And they saw an increase in bitterness and astringency um, and a decrease in anthocyanin, but an increase in polymeric pigment. So what that means is that the free anthocyanins go down because they're binding up to small tannins and becoming more stable color. And this again is from uh, Frederico Casasa. So shout out to a fellow MW student. So the impact of XMAC is really determined by the length of time. And um, if you talk to winemakers who are really serious about XMAC, they might tell you about the softening effect that they experience on the wines. So an, uh, an example here is the intrinsic wines by St. Michelle Wine Estates. Um, so uh, winemaker uh, Juan uh, Minozoka um, has been experimenting with like pretty extreme XMAC, like um, eight, eight months-ish. Um, and they do their primary and they just lock it up in tank. And um, what they've experienced is after a, a long period of time, the wines get incredibly soft actually. So um, Juan's pretty excited about that because he says that it's, um, they don't need to use the same level of oak um, on those wines as they do on the other wines in the program because the tannins are already lush and soft. So um, that's an example of um, conventionally produced wines but still with pretty hot, extreme levels of extended maceration. So intrinsic wines from St. Michelle Wine Estates in Washington, United States. So moving on to primary fermentation uh, concerns. So looking at different cap management techniques. So we have three different studies here uh, from three different countries. One is from UC Davis on a uh, low dye cab sob. So that's from California in 2012. And uh, they found that the pump over volume, so basically the amount of wine that was pumped over the cap didn't make a difference. And they also found that the frequency of those pump overs didn't make a difference. Uh, there was a study from South Africa on Pinotage, and they found that Punchdown and Roto Fermenter had a higher level of tannin extraction than a standard pump over. And then there was a study in Spain um, on Mencia from Galicia, and they found that Roto Fermenter was better than mechanical Punchdown, which is better than pump over, better than manual Punchdown better than Delastage Rack and Return, and, and then all of those were better than the Ganymede Auto Fermenter. That's so, those little fermenters that um, are auto, like they um, are powered entirely by CO2 pressure. So um, something of note here, um, all of these studies are mentioning pump over, which is a pretty standard thing to do in the wine industry, just because it's one of the lowest labor things you can do, especially at large scale. But what happens during a pump over is you can get channeling in the cap. So basically what happens is the liquid's taking the path of least resistance. So um, you keep pumping over the cap and the liquid wine coming from the tank just keeps going through those same channels through the cap and it's not extracting any new material into, into the wine. So that might be an argument for uh, switching up cap management like um, 
putting in some air to roll the cap, for example, to make sure that you expose some new material to the wine to the, so that it can be extracted. During primary fermentation, we can add a few things to the ferment. Um, so additional tannins can be added, sort of in a similar style to what was done up front during the crushing. And this mainly impacts color stabilization um, because tannin plus those aldehydes that are made during fermentation plus color equals a nice stable color compound. So here's an example of something that can be added during fermentation. So this is a fermentation or cellaring grape tannin, and actually it's a proof, or it's used on both red and white wines. So uh, this Scott tan uvatan is made from grape tannins from both skins and seeds. And there's, uh, the product supplier is saying that this is particularly useful when natural grape tannin levels are deficient. And if you're adding it post-primary, it can be used to stabilize your color or enhance the structure and also provide antioxidant act, uh, protection. So um, phenolics are great antioxidants. Um, so basically the antioxidant protection is just uh, providing because of the little bit of tannin extra that's in there. And a controversial question, uh, do tannin additions actually work? Um, so a few um, researchers have been looking into this. So there was a study on Shiraz from Victoria, Australia on VR Supra versus oak chips. And they found that the VR Supra increased the total phenolics, so the tannin, uh, compared to chips and their control of no add. And it also increased the color density. Um, and then there was another product that uh, called G-Seed X uh, that was used on Shiraz from Australia, and they found no significant difference in color or tannin and no difference in sensory after one year. So we have two conflicting studies here. Um, and that's where it gets down to winemaker opinion. There's some winemakers who are adding t um, tannin adjuncts. This is a standard operating procedure. And then there are some winemakers that say, well, why am I just throwing my money away on something that I don't believe is working? So here, in my opinion, is the most important piece, and this is primary fermentation temperature. So at higher temperatures, molecules move down their concentration gradient more quickly, so things um, are, tannin and color are just extracting more rapidly out of the grape and into the liquid. And then um, enzymatic reactions, um, which are important for different kinds of color stabilization, what have you, are happening more quickly. Um, and I've put in brackets here up to a point. So if, if you get to too hot of a temperature, everything stops happening. But um, this, uh, think about this in the bounds of conventional fermentation temperatures, which would be like from 15 Celsius to maybe 35 degrees Celsius. So um, multiple studies show that a higher ferment temperature increases color, tannin, and stable color in wine. Um, and one of the reasons for that is the extraction rate is higher, so things are coming out more quickly and you're getting to your goal earlier. Here is a note on thermovinification and flash detente. So um, one of those examiner's reports mentioned that you should be considering um, multiple uh, price points on finished wines um, and multiple techniques, including things like thermovinification. So in thermal vinification, the highest temperature is 85 to 80, or excuse me, 80 to 85 C, and then it's cooled down to a, a warm temperature of 35 to 40 C. Um, in flash detente, um, the peak temperature is a teeny bit higher, but they cold crash it hard um, down to a little bit lower. Um, so this is still a moderate temperature of 30 to 32 C. Uh, so um, 35 to 40 um, for people, I, I love giving weather examples because not everyone here is living in the Celsius world. Um, 35 to 40, that's a hot summer day. 30 to 32, that's a warm, uh, that's a summer day, a warm summer day. Um, pros on these things for both uh, Thermovin and Flash Detente, uh, excellent color extraction, but the issue is that the molecules are imbalanced. So um, the color all comes out totally brilliant, but then there's basically no tannin extraction. Um, so uh, small molecules uh, come out more easily with heat. 
big molecules need uh, something that helps them get soluble, like ethanol. So we're having a high level of color and no tannin. And what ends up happening is that color has nothing to bind to to get stable. So there usually needs to be an adjunct product added with this process to stabilize that color. So there could be the addition of tannins before heating. Uh, it binds up proteins and also provides some material um, to uh, bind to the color. Or there can be a specifically formulated tannin to use after heating that binds color as well. Moving on to pressing. So anecdotally, many winemakers prefer free run juice uh, due to the lack of astringency or bitterness. Um, and I'm really struggling to find any research about actual specific phenolics in between press cuts at different pressures. Um, so something to note also about pressing, um, all, in almost all red ferments, the seeds are going to sink to the bottom of the fermenter and the skins are going to float to the top. So when you're uh, preparing a wine to go, a red wine to go to press, seeds aren't really part of the equation anymore because the seeds are at the bottom of the tank or bin. This is the best that I got for you. Um, and this is actually from College Cellars here. Um, and this is a look at tannin in press, fra press, press fractions on our 2018 Cab Saw from Walla Walla. So we, uh, if you take a look at the bottom there, you can see the pressure. So free run all the way up to 1.4 bar. And then the axis is concentration of tannin. So interestingly enough, the tannin was highest in the free run and then uh, reached an, uh, a second highest level in the hard press. And here are the corresponding catechin values. So those are the more small kind of bitter tannins um, and they reach a peak in that low level of pressure. It's really interesting to see actually that we saw a minimum value at that 0.8 bar. And here are the anthocyanin values. Um, so it looks like, you know, there's just not much more to give out of those, um, out of, uh, those grape skins. They've pretty much given it up. So our free run had the highest level of color compounds. So the reason I uh, wanted to show you this information is just because it's really the best that I can do right now. Um, I can't find any other, um, I can't find any research on this topic right now. So I wanted to give you something. Um, but I recognize that this can be a little bit tough to interpret. Um, so um, I think the one thing that we can say for sure here is the highest level of color is coming out in the free run before uh, we send the wine to press. But pretty much everything else, I'm like, fuck, I don't know. <laughs> that's pretty hard to wade through. Here's something that's a little more simple. Uh, Post-ferment oxygen and micro-oxygenation. So acid aldehyde is just oxidized alcohol and it's the glue for phenolic compounds. So it's gluing our smaller tannins into larger, more mature tannins and it's gluing free color uh, to other things that stabilizes that color so it doesn't get bleached or drop out. Here are some values from Inardis um, talking about oxygenation. Um, during ferment, between alcoholic fermentation and malolactic fermentation, and post-fermentation. So um, I don't think that I need to talk this one out entirely with you, but these are some good examples of oxygen levels and when to add them. When we're doing it during fermentation, we're adding oxygen um, mainly for yeast health, but if we're adding a huge amount, it can actually modify our tannins and glue them up together for stability. Oh, as my phone's going off there. If we're doing this in between alcoholic fermentation and malolactic fermentation, it helps to stabilize color and improve structure. And um, also uh, some of this can help blow off some reduction to remove some reductive characters. Um, some people also say they can help with herbaceousness. In post-malolactic, um, 
what we can do um, is simulate the conditions of a barrel in a tank by doing really low doses of oxygen uh, with the use of an oak adjunct um, as a way of simulating barrel um, in a much more effective uh, and a lower cost way. Use of oak can also modify color and tannin. Um, oak in all formats contributes elagic tannins to wine. So these are oak derived tannins and their concentration is around the sensory threshold level. So basically overall they have low astringency contribution but they don't taste like much. And these small um, aromatic compounds, um, or excuse me, um, these elagic tannins can interact with color and tannin and also small aromatic compounds that come out of oak can interact with phenolics that come from the grape. So an example here of that could be vanillin uh, and that stabilizes color. That's a vanilla aroma or aldehydes um, which can also come out to stabilize color and polymerize tannin. Additionally, uh, fining techniques can be used to remove tannin in color from red wines or white wines actually as well. So um, here's a few examples of proteinaceous um, fining agents uh, here. One is gelatin. So uh, gelatin is derived from boiled bones. Um, it's collagen that um, is uh, unwound um, due to heat and it's our most aggressive fining agent. It's really good at removing both tannin and color. Albumin, which is derived from eggs. Um, actually, it's uh, egg whites. So um, fun fact uh, that keeps me remembering albumin is that the cannelay pastries that are really high in egg yolks are from um, Bordeaux. And one of the reasons is they have an excess of egg yolks because they're doing egg white fining. Isinglass is derived from the swim bladder of the sturgeon fish, um, gross, uh, and it's a relatively gentle fining agent. And casein um, or potassium caseinate is derived from milk. Pretty good at color removal, not so good at uh, tannin removal. There are some other options for fining in red wines which are um, a little less common. One is carbon, which is the nuclear option. It's an indiscriminate fining agent, so it's gonna bind everything. That means tannin, that means color, that means flavor. PVPP um, hasn't historically been used for red wines that much, but the reason that I'm putting it on this list is that um, in my work um, on red wines, um, I've been finding that PVPP can be really quite helpful. Um, it's more commonly used on white wines and specifically actually white juices to remove bitterness um, from press fractions, um, from white juices at the press. But um, the reason that it's good at removing bitterness from white juices is because it's great at binding up tiny compounds, tiny phenolics. And if you're trying to remove some bitterness from a red wine, you're probably trying to remove um, a small uh, phenolic compound. So PVPP can be very helpful. And for fining agents, I actually have some cool data. So uh, this is from my work and uh, extra, extra thank you to ETS Laboratories uh, for performing the analysis on this. So this is uh, Cabernet Sauvignon from the Walla Walla Valley. And these are multiple fining agents. So if you take a look at the bottom there, you're gonna see a control, PVPP, carbon, casein, which is uh, the milk stuff, albumin, which is the swim bladder stuff, and gelatin, which is the bone stuff. So we can see on our control, PVPP didn't impact our tannin very highly. Carbon impacted it a little bit more. And you can see all the way down to gelatin there, which really nuked it. Looking at catechin, which is that small bitter tannin, PVPP was a miracle. Look at that. There's barely any left. So for uh, CD flavors and bitterness in a wine, um, PVPP looks like the way to go. Looking at polymeric anthocyanins, so that means stabilized color compounds. It pretty much follows the, uh, the trend there of our, um, of our tannin levels where gelatin was the most effective. 
And here's a look at total anthocyanin. So that means the free color and the stabilized color. Um, carbon had the highest level of impact there. So now we're at the end and we're trying to do our uh, cruising altitude 32,000 foot view. So on the theory side of things here, tannin are large phenolics. Little things bind up to become tannin and these compounds are astringent and structural. Catechin is a small tannin monomer that's bitter. Anthocyanins are color and in their monomeric free form they're young, bright, and unstable. Um, in their polymeric form they're stable but they're also slightly more brown. So this is something that you know with your eyes after seeing aged wines. Elagitannins are oak tannins and they have maybe a light level of astringency, but they can also act um, as a stabilizing effect by binding up tannin and color. And oxygen forms the glue here. Oxygen plus alcohol equals acetaldehyde, so oxygen is very important for stability. On the practical management side here, if we crush our fruit, we can increase our tannin in color because we're increasing the skin to juice uh, extraction. If we add an enzyme that increases uh, the amount of tannin in color that comes out and increases the rate, we're going to have an impact uh, by increasing the tannin in color. If we do a tannin add, we could increase the tannin in color stability, but I put in brackets probably here. Um, this is something that's still a little bit controversial. Increasing our ferment temp definitely increases um, the tannin in color extraction rate. Thermovinification results in the rapid release of unstable color that then has to be subsequently stabilized with a product. Oxygen use um, helps to stabilize color and polymerize smaller tannins into more plush, smooth, large, mature tannins. Oak can add oak tannins and also has a small contribution of oxygen, which can help uh, stabilize color and tannin. And different fining agents can remove tannin and color. So thank you for watching. Here is the world's best winemaker, Digby, doing a manual punch down on some Pinot Gris grapes, uh, as you can see here from this little animated GIF. Um, this has been a pretty big presentation, and I recognize that I also I haven't gone over uh, sparkling wine, rosé wines, white wines, orange wines, that kind of stuff. Um, and I do absolutely have some thoughts and opinions and information there. It's just such a large topic that it's hard to put that information into this presentation. So. Um, Many of you should have my contact information. Uh, shoot me a note if you want to um, get some examples for those styles of winemaking. And for further reading, um, here are all those um, uh, scientific studies that I referenced uh, in the middle part of this presentation. There's a lot. Alrighty. Chin chin. Happy studying.